Rise and shine, everybody. It's time to wake up with Susan. Spiritual awakening can be a beautiful, messy, and sometimes lonely journey. So let's do it together. I'm your host, Susan Sutherland. I'm an intuitive healer and spiritual mentor. We are all called to rise up above our conditioning and limiting beliefs and shine our light on ourselves and others. So let's get to it. Hi, family. Thanks for joining me today. Today, we're going to do a little talk about our teens, um, which I've been really nervous to record this, but it keeps coming up and keeps coming up. And I know that it does because there is an episode for me to do about it. Um, But it is still a tricky conversation to have because I definitely don't want anybody to think I am pushing my ideas on them. My point of this episode is really to let you know how I have considered my parenting journey. What I know leads me to make the decisions that I make um, on the expectations I have for my kids, but you know how I have identified my limiting beliefs and my wounds that I am parenting through, because when you have that awareness, you can make choices. You can you can make decisions about how you parent instead of being on autopilot. Um, when we are on autopilot, you are basically parenting like you were parented. And a lot of times there, there are some adjustments that could be made. When we start to see a pattern, we can shift that pattern. But it also um, deals with the expectations that our society has put on our kids and our parenting styles. And so a lot of times we get in this loop of doing things the way everybody's doing them without questioning, is this is this really what I value? Is this really a priority for me? Or do I want to shift the narrative in my home with my family? And this came up for me recently because Mark and I were out on a walk and and he asked me, he's like, why do you not push Dashiell, who is our 15 year old? And so we needed to have a, a real open conversation about where I'm coming from as a parent, where he's coming from and really kind of get on the same page with that. And we've made a lot, a lot of strides in our parenting journey to really become responsive parents and not reactive parents to dial back and see, okay, this is the situation. What is, what is the response I choose? But that has been a journey in getting there. It's one I'm really proud of. And I am not saying the decisions I'm making are the right ones. I'm just going to let you know how I came to them, what my limiting beliefs are that I am trying to nurture my children through so that you can start just looking at your own journey, your own journey as a teenager yourself, and look at what your expectations are for your children, and if that's fair, and maybe it is, or or if some shifts need to be made. Right now, we have created a society where teens are expected to graduate high school with a 4.4 GPA, have a part-time job, participate in four clubs on three sports, volunteer on the weekends. I mean, the expectations of what they are meant to do as 16 to 18 year olds is so incredibly ridiculous in my mind. And I get, well, that's just how it is. Well, that's just not how it is if we start changing the narrative. And we have, we've subscribed to that. And, and then we think, well, I want to have my child be successful. And so I'm going to make sure they're signed up for, you know, 80 hours of work every week between sports and volunteering and a job and, 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 and and then have a tutor so they can, you know, succeed in their three AP classes. And I'm just saying, I can only do it for one family and say, stop the bus. This is, this is not something I'm subscribing to. And the reason I'm not subscribing to it is because that to me 
leads to a person who finds their value in overworking, in working 60 hours and participating in this and being, you know, a a doctor and the head of the PTA and this and this and this and not having a balanced life that has joy in it, that has health and nourishment in it. And so when we have that expectation of our adults and then we shift them and have them on our teens, they they don't understand how to create balance. We're not being examples of that in our own lives. And then we're expecting them to to go so far beyond what should be expected of a a 16 year old. And so I'll just kind of speak to where I'm coming from and, and how my experiences growing up and my experiences as an adult have really shaped this opinion. But it, it has also allowed me to sit sometimes by myself, sometimes with my husband, and really focus on what is a priority for our family. And, um, you know, if if going to the school of your dreams um, or getting a full ride scholarship, if, if playing sports in college, if those are your priorities, first of all, oh my God, please let it be your child's priority and not yours. Because it it is heartbreaking to me how many people, how many parents are living vicariously through their children and putting the expectations and and their limitations of what they didn't fulfill or maybe where the high point of their life is and, and putting that expectation on their kids. Guys, it has got to stop. Anyway, that's a, we'll come back to that. But in my house, in my heart, I value as much a comment from the teacher of my my child being a really good friend and a leader who can, you know, kind of corral with kindness or having the lunch lady tell me how respectful my children are to her in the lunchroom. I value that as much as a history quiz. No, 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 that's not true. I value that more than a history quiz. And I am not saying they are not learning very important fundamentals in school. Of course they are. I'm just saying there is a lot that is not reflected on a report card. There is a lot that is not reflected in a GPA. And a lot of those things have so much value to me. Now, I have three kids and they are individuals. I mean, very much their likes, their strengths, their talkativeness. They are they are very individual. And so having a blanket, this is what we do in my family, does not work for me because I really understand that they came in with their own strengths, but their own soul's journey. And it is my job to know that their soul knows better than I am, know that their soul knows better than I do about what that journey is. And it is my job to keep them safe and have them feel loved so that they can explore and lead with their heart and really find what works for them. And I will tell you on many different places I have been wrong. (laughs) My daughter, bless her heart, when she was little, she didn't even want to walk. She would have an au pair carry her everywhere she went. If if one was around, they were her little besties. And it'd be like, I don't want to walk anymore. And they would carry her. Like, girl didn't want to sweat. She didn't want to move. And now she plays three sports for her school. And I wouldn't have seen that coming. I wouldn't have encouraged it. I wouldn't have pushed it. And in our house, you can have one activity. I've got three kids. Getting three kids to an activity, one activity each, and two of them are only at the school now. um, That's as that's as much as I can do. And I'm not I'm not going to make our whole family life crazy so that we can schlep around, you know, from 
this activity to this activity and this lesson to this lesson. It's just not what I choose because one of the values that we have, one of the focuses for our family is having dinner at home. And, and we try to do that together as often as possible. That is something we chose as a family. We want to have dinner together. This is important to us. So when I was talking to Mark and he was asking why I don't push Dashiell more, I asked Mark what his grades were like in high school. And I already knew the answer. They weren't great, right? Now he ended up going to college and then going and getting his master's. And he has a very successful business. He employs, I think, 20 people. Um, he's made a great career for himself. And it had nothing to do with his high school achievement. It has to do with his perseverance and his desire and and all of these other attributes that make him successful, but it had nothing to do with his high school grades. And then some of the people that I know that had the most magnificent grades don't have a successful career or have what would, you know, society would deem as a successful career, but I do not see it as successful because I don't think working all the time and it doesn't matter if you make $3 million and you don't have any time to spend it or any downtime or you're on blood pressure and cholesterol medication because you can't get to the gym and take care of yourself because you are so overworked. That's not success to me at all. And it's really important to understand what success looks like to you. And my definition is so different. So Zoj started playing soccer in fifth grade. And when she asked me to play, this is still when she didn't like to run. She didn't like to sweat. She didn't like activity. And I thought maybe she didn't know what soccer was because I don't know what soccer really, I don't know how to play it, but I know they run back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for a very long time. And so I did not try to talk her out to, out of it, but like, are you really sure? And told her that if she started, she had to see the season through. And so later she told me that for the first month, she absolutely hated it, that all they did was run and she absolutely hates running. Um, but after she had done it for a little while, she began to love it. And this year, her third year, they ended up getting a coach for the team who is an actual soccer coach. He's not like the teacher at the school with a short straw. He is a soccer coach. And I, gosh, I could just, I could hug him every day. The amount of self-confidence he instilled in my daughter and a love for the game and a passion for improvement and being a student of the sport. He had them reading a book about the game and, and just taught them so much that was so far above whether or not you're winning a game. But he really opened her up to a whole new level of not just competition, but really just I don't know, learning about herself on the field, about working with others and leading a team. And I mean, there was so much growth over the season. And so what success looks like to me is not if you're 80 hours as a, you know, hedge fund manager. Success looks for to me like you're a coach who can completely change somebody's experience on a field and probably in her life. Because you took the time to really nourish a connection. That's success. He has something that not only does he love, but he is able to impact other people in such a profound and beautiful way through what he is doing. That's success. And so if you are telling me that you have to have a, you know, Ivy League college education to go and make an impact, I'm telling you, you're wrong. This man made such a difference in her life this year by by being kind, by being encouraging, by being knowledgeable, knowledgeable and patient, by being a student of the game himself and really understanding how kids work and and how they learn and how they listen. And so I'm just so appreciative of somebody who who found his passion 
and figured out how to make an impact through that. And that is success. That is what success looks like to me. And so I do think it's important that we start redefining what we want to see as success. Is it somebody who is working their butt off all the time, but is short with other people who is stressed out and taking it out on their kids or their parents? Do we want somebody who's maxed out and not sleeping at night and they're 17 years old, but have so much stress that they can't get a good night's sleep. I'm just saying that in my house, I choose to question that. I choose to question whether or not that's what I want our values to be and how I want to define success. Now, I'll tell you that among my biggest limiting beliefs that I have had to overcome on this journey, this self-discovery journey that I'm on, is that I am less than because I didn't finish college. And so let me tell you about a balance beam to walk on if you question if it's really that important, but also have felt limited by it your whole life. Like it is very tricky, but I've had to do so much work around thinking that somehow that piece of paper would define my value and that I'm less than for not having it. And you know what blows my mind is I didn't even intend to go to a four-year college. My, my plan, my beautiful plan, you know how those plans work out, was to go to a fashion design school. I was going to art school in Atlanta when my mom was diagnosed and I was going to live with my older sister who was living there um, in Atlanta and she had finished college and she was working there. And so the plan was for me to go and be her roommate and go to art school. Well, my sister had a terrible car wreck and my mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. My sister moved home and then I was home, but also obviously not going to Atlanta to live by myself and go to college because I couldn't afford that. And also my, our whole life was turned upside down with my mom's diagnosis and then shortly after her death. And so when she died in July, I didn't know what my plan was, but UNCC was like 25 minutes down the road. And so I just went and applied and I got in. And so I started going to school there in August. And then I ended up dropping out, I guess, two and a half years later and going and getting an IT degree and getting a job. The first interview I went on, I got that job and I never had another interview until I quit my job 21 years later or something. And I felt limited the whole time because all of the, the postings for anything say, you know, college degree required, blah, blah, blah. And so I felt trapped in this space. I can't leave because the college degree is required. Side note, one of my shadow frequencies in Gene Keys, how things show up in a negative frequency for me is feeling trapped. And if you have heard my conversations on marriage or my job or anything, like that's how a shadow frequency shows up for me is entrapment. Anyway, um, because I didn't have this college degree, I have felt so limited. And so in all of my work that I have been doing on myself. It is about knowing that my value doesn't come from that paper or any other paper. Like I am inherently worthy because I am, because I am, just because I am, because, because I am here, because I am this being the soul, I have value and I am entirely worthy without anything else. And that is a process to get through all of those limiting beliefs because we define everybody based on their merits, based on their achievement, based on their salary, their job, their accomplishments, their trophies, their, you know, sports accolades, everything is merit based in this world. And so to try to convince yourself that somehow you are worthy without that, y'all, it is a process. But now as I parent, I think the most important thing to me is for them to know they are worthy just because. That they are no less worthy with a C than they are with an A. Now, what bugs me is when they don't apply themselves at all, 
when there's missing assignments or I feel like they are not putting in the effort that school deserves. And I remind them that good grades and even sports, those open doors, there's no doubt about it. And it will open doors and give you choices, but it does not define your worth. It doesn't define your worth. You are not worth anything less if you choose not to go to college. In fact, there's great reasons to not go to to a traditional university and to go to a trade school or to find something else that allows your passion. But I want it to be led by their heart and not a society's expectation of what they should be doing. Also, side note, I never had like a dorm room college experience, an on-campus college experience because I was a commuter and then just my whole college experience was like a total train wreck. And I want them to have the option of that. I think it's a great place to kind of go and have a little time to grow up. Not because it's going to define who you are, but because 18, you're still young and you you can have a little more time to have a good time and have, um, you know, some responsibilities and a lot of independence, but start figuring out who you are. And I think can be a wonderful experience that I missed out on. And so I don't want to diminish that as an opportunity if that's what they want. But I also want them to know that my love for them is not contingent. It is not contingent on grades. It is not contingent on trophies or placement. It is really important to look at how you were parented and understand where your triggers are, and understand where your wounds are, and see if you are acting out on those. I know I talked to my dad recently, and he had gone to see Dashiell play tennis and said, you know, I wasn't going to talk about it with him then, but before he plays next year, I want to tell him that he doesn't always have to hit it so hard. Now, he is right. Okay, Dashiell doesn't have a 70%. He wants to hit the cover off the ball every single time to his detriment quite a lot. Like it's not always controlled. He is going to hit it hard. And for a while, I don't think this is true any longer, but for a while, I could whip his tail on the tennis court without hitting a single winner. Like didn't have to hit a single winner, just had to wait on him to make an error. And so what my dad was saying, was complete facts, right? But when he said it, it made the hairs on my neck stand up. Because what I remember as a child was that my validation came with wins. My validation came through performance. There wasn't a there wasn't a cuddly aspect to my dad. It was it was very achievement driven. Now I have a great relationship with my dad. I do I do not think he was a bad parent. I don't think any of that. But when I am triggered by something, especially if he's talking about my kid, I know that me really embracing them in a different way is a response to what I felt from him. Now, he is only here to be my teacher and me to be his teacher. There's no animosity. I don't think he did anything wrong. I just have to parent from the understanding of why why am I so sensitive about my kids? And like, if Mark says something to them, I'm so quick to defend and want to protect them and protect their worthiness um, and it's it's really interesting because I was also raised by a guidance counselor. She was patient. She was kind and generous. She absolutely did not know how to nurture herself because she put everybody first. And so in a lot of ways, what I have learned from her and doing things differently is really that my hobbies matter, that Um, My time matters for me to take care of myself and that taking care of myself is a way to take care of my family. 
But as far as her being patient and nurturing, that was never an issue. But if you've ever been around a guidance counselor, you will know that (laughs) we do have a focus on, you know, what something looks like and how is this going to go on your your applications. Now, she was also accepting of me taking a different route because I was a very different child. My, She understood that me and my brother and my sister are very different. And if I wanted to go to art school, that was okay with her. And she didn't really push me in a different direction if that's what I wanted. My brother is among the smartest people I know. He is only 12 months older than me. And so When you follow somebody in school and you are the sibling, it is, it's very tricky. It is very tricky to get out of a shadow. And a lot of times I would do that in very inappropriate ways by acting out or, you know, just kind of being a class clown or being silly. But I was aware of his intelligence. And for me, how that played out is. I could get low A's without trying, and that felt better to me than trying and then not being as smart as him. Does that make any sense? I mean, I already told y'all I fell down and faked injury at track meets so that I didn't have to come in less than first or second. Like, let me go ahead and tell you, this has been a pattern in my life of being afraid to give it your all, because if you give it your all and don't finish first, that's failure. And so that is something I see showing up about how much I need my kids to know that their best is always good enough. Like if you are trying, it's good enough. And sometimes maybe you're even trying too hard, but it is an interesting dynamic. I mean, my brother challenged his AP physics teacher and was kicked out of the class, essentially, and had to do self-study in the library and still had the highest grade, which is bananas, but that's how smart he is. But he also was working in a corporation and on anxiety medications and really unhappy in life and and not living a balanced life and is better now um, doing his own thing and delivering food or whatever. And, and so do I think that having the highest grades or, or being the smartest or, or whatever, I don't think that's guaranteed success. I think how you feel about yourself inside is really important. And so my goal is to nurture them in a way that they know it's safe to try. They know it's safe to fail. They know it's safe to experiment and play soccer, play, play whatever you want to and see how it goes. And, and if you don't like it, and it's a one year thing, that's fine, but you're going to do it because you want to do it. Not because I want you to do it. So if you're whipping your child to perform or spend all this time on the field or, you know, studying to make sure their GPA is a certain level, just really take a minute and see where that's coming from. Were you expected to achieve to earn your parents' approval, to earn their love? Is it because you are successful and genuinely happy in your job? Because I feel like my stepsister says that the only thing she ever knew was that she wanted to be a mother and a lawyer. And now she's a lawyer. In fact, she's a judge. But I think if you have that in your gut, if you know that, you know good grades are important. You know. Schooling is going to be important. You have that internal drive and nobody needs to be your your whipper to keep you into shape. You've got that passion inside of you. And when it is coming from within, that's really important. Now, I, I still say that should be controlled. We went to the beach for Labor Day and my daughter, who's in seventh grade, had a science project that she had to do over Labor Day, which I think is totally ridiculous. Perhaps it was assigned a few days before, but I'm not positive. Anyway, she spent the entire Labor Day working on this project. And 
it was crazy good. However, she, she like mirrored her pictures onto the page so she could trace them and everything looked perfect, 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 perfect. And then on the Tuesday, she had a dentist appointment when she was supposed to turn it in. We went to the dentist and I dropped her off at school and she was like, oh my gosh, mom, I forgot to bring my science project. And she had texted me and I was like, okay, I mean, we live 30 minutes from school. I've already driven to the school to get her there. Now I'm going to drive home, get her project, take it back to her. <laughs> and then, I mean, she did spend the entire holiday weekend on it. So let me just go get this project. And she texts me back and she's like, actually, we get out at one o'clock today. So for tennis, for a tennis match, and I'm not going to have that class. So don't even worry about it. And I was like, are you sure? She's sure we don't have the class. It's fine. Well, they ended up at 12 o'clock changing the dismissal time. And she had to go to that class and didn't have the project. And her teacher was like, well, that's an automatic 70. That school policy is that you get a 70. And so the next day she took it in and told me what happened. And I did send her t teacher a picture of the text. Like she acknowledged that she didn't have it early in the day. And I was going to bring it, but she wasn't even supposed to be in the class. And her teacher's like, so sorry, this is policy. And I sat with that, like mama bear wanted to be like, that's just pretty good, ridiculous. But I sat there and thought, actually, the most important lesson for this child who spends so much time doing homework and writing notes and rewriting notes and like an exorbitant amount of time doing homework. What she needed to know is that project wasn't that important. She had, she got a 70 on it. She, she spent in her entire holiday weekend and got a 70 and it didn't really impact her grade. Like when it was all said and done, when it gets averaged in, it wasn't that big of a deal. And she's the child who overworks and needed that lesson. Like, let it go. Go to the beach. Like, it's not that serious. It's seventh grade. And so it's really important to understand what each child needs because some of them are going to work themselves. And you need to be the voice of reason that says, you know what's really important? Go outside. Go play with your friends in the neighborhood. Go, go hang out a little bit because this is seventh grade. <laughs> it's, legit seventh grade. And then some need encouragement. My my poor little third child, I'm not going to say poor little because he is going to be so much better for this. But this was his last year of the reading log. You remember the reading logs, don't you? Oh my goodness. When the first child comes through, then the reading log means each night for 20 minutes, I'm going to lay in the bed. We're going to read together and we're going to write on that reading log. And that's going to be that. And for the third child, it's like the 26th of the month. I'm like, have you done your reading? And he might have eight hours left to do or whatever. He doesn't have the same follow up <laughs> that the first child did. However, he is the most independent of my children. He knows how to get his stuff together the night before. He knows where everything is. He knows, I mean, he, he came down dressed in a fancy shirt yesterday. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> He's like, well, it's my lower school con concert today. I'm like, huh, I didn't know about that. He's like, I'm pretty sure they sent 20 emails. Of course they did, but it didn't register to me like concert when you're in middle school and upper school. Up uh, the chorus is separate. That's a whole separate thing. And we're in the band. I don't go to that. But of course, lower school concert. So fortunately, I was able to go to that. But that's my, my, my sweet little third child. The first one would not have been dressed appropriately. I would have needed to be on top of everything for him. And so it's just important to really reflect why you're making the decisions you're making. What is it in you, in your inner self that is being expressed in your parenting? And is it from a healed space? Is it coming from a place where you are making a decision and not reacting to the wounds that you have from your journey as a child? And that's, it's, that's a really an important reflection. I also 
would really like to encourage you to reflect on how you are expressing emotion. If you are getting mad and screaming, if you are slamming doors or having timber tantrums, how can you expect them to respond in a different way? Like you really need to start looking at where the anger is coming from, what is looking to be expressed and start taking pauses before you respond to the children because we are asking them to regulate emotions when we're not capable of doing it. And that's not fair because your kids, they may not listen to a freaking word you say, but they watch how you act. And it's really important to understand that how you are responding to them they are going to respond as well. Oh my gosh. Even on the soccer field, um, my daughter told me we were talking about teammates and she was like, well, she actually just yells at all of us. And I said, well, if you've ever listened on the sidelines, that is how she is taught to communicate at home. I'm sure she knows her mom loves her very much. And her mom is screaming the whole time in a, a tone to me, That seems aggressive and angry and not one of love and encouragement. And um, and that's how she communicates to her teammates. That is how she has learned to communicate. And we can't expect them to operate any differently. And so when I told my daughter that is like, okay, that makes sense. And she's not going to take it personally because that that is how that child has learned to communicate. And she can see that pattern there. And instead of saying like, oh, she's awful, she's mean. No, she's communicating exactly how she is communicated to. So if you are expressing frustration through yelling, through swearing or name calling, or, you know, telling them they're useless or getting so frustrated, please don't expect anything other than that from them. That's not fair. That's not fair. They are immature and haven't developed their emotions or their, their emotional IQ, their EQ. So it's not fair to expect them to do something that you're still working on. It all has to be in a work in progress. And as you say, oh my gosh, I'm really sorry that I handled it that way. I'd like us to to take a moment and have a conversation about that. I even had to do this recently. It's all a journey. I'm still working on this all the time. I don't get super frustrated with my kids often. Like I've done a lot of work to get there. But I looked on the cafeteria website the other day and noticed that my kids are freaking spending money out the wazoo at the cafeteria. $4 coffees and empanada snacks and this and this and, you know, just lunch is $7.50. So I'm spending $50 a day in a freaking cafeteria at school without even knowing it. And I was so irritated when I picked them up at the bus stop and we got home and I showed them all this and I I let loose on them. And then I started thinking about it and I was like, the money wasn't the important thing. We have that money. In fact, I didn't even know it was missing. Like I didn't even know it was being spent. So this is from, from me. This is from my little self. My little Susan, how, how, what was I allowed to spend? What was I limited in? Why am I acting like that? And I had to go back and not that there it's a free for all and they're allowed to spend $50, but I'm doing a money mindset book and they were just reflecting something that I needed to work through from my childhood back to me. They were just being a mirror and I sat down with them and I said, Hey, I'm really sorry for how I responded to that. I didn't handle it well. You actually were helping me do some work that I needed to do. But this is this is what I want the solution to be going forward. You know, we're going to set a parameter on what's an acceptable amount to spend at school because I want you to feel like you have choices. I want you to to feel comfortable getting something, getting a treat when you want a treat, but it can't get out of hand like that. Or, you know, we just have to have a level of trust that I know what is being spent. So I don't feel like it's behind my back. But I really had to be the grown up and say, you know what? I did not handle that well. And I didn't handle it well because of my own personal wounds. So let's talk about that. And they responded very well. And then we came up with a system. I mean, at this point, this year's 
gone. But next year, we're going to have a system of how they can, you know, utilize the lunch, have freedom, but also learn financial responsibility. And so that's something that we can work through together. But it was important for me to be like, whoop, that that was not cool. I didn't handle that in a good way. I think it's really important to to evaluate how you handle stress and how you handle conflict. If you are having a stressful day and carry on talking about how you need alcohol, you know, like, oh my God, it's been a hard day. Give me a drink. That kind of thing. Just understand that for your teens, they hear you. This is how we cope with stress. And so I'm not saying alcohol is bad that you shouldn't have a drink, but you should have a drink from a place of I'd like to have a drink and not from a place of this is going to cure my woes. This is going to make a bad day better because when you are modeling that kind of behavior, kids have bad days too. I don't want them to think that the way out of a bad day is by having alcohol. There are very, very healthy ways to process stress, to handle conflict with friends. There are really healthful ways where you can better your health by handling stress. Go to the gym. Um, Heavy weights uh, will really sort some stuff out, I promise you. Um, A run. A, a walk and talk with a friend, a nap, <laughs> like go outside and, and sit with the trees. There are so many great ways to process stress. And so even if you are a drinker, if you enjoy your alcohol, just make sure you're not communicating to your teens that the acceptable way to process stress is by drinking. That's really not the vibe we want for our kids and how you take care of yourself. Like you really are a model for, for how they will behave. You can look at your parents and know that you are modeling them until you see patterns and choose to correct them. You are modeling what your parents did. What are you modeling for your children? How do you take care of yourself and prioritize your sleep and your diet and your exercise? When you talk about success, Are you talking about somebody's salary? Are you talking about their career achievements? Or are you talking about the impact they make with other people? Are you talking about their happiness? Some of the most successful people I know are teachers um, who are vastly underpaid, like holy cow. But I feel like teachers are one of those careers that a lot of individuals just have this spark in their heart that says, this is what I want to do. This is what, this is what my calling is. And it's not about the salary that they're going to get because that's not fair. (laughs) It is not fair what our teachers make, but you can see that they are doing what they are called to do and the impact that they make with our children is so profound. One good teacher can just really change the course of, of a person's life. It was really sweet. My my mother was a guidance counselor. Before that, she was a psychology teacher. And you know what's really cool is um, the high school that I went to, they still do a Janine Libran scholarship. And for the past many years, Mark and I fund the scholarship. But what I love about it is it's not academic and it's not athletic. It is a kindness of heart scholarship. It is for someone who has a service heart or it's just like the kindest person. And I love that so freaking much. Um, But I also had somebody reach out to me recently. They were looking for her. One of her classes, this is like mind blowing to me that this could be possible, but um, one of the classes she taught early on had their 50th reunion, their 50th high school reunion. And so they started looking for her and they found information about her from the scholarship and reached out to me and knew she'd passed away. That's why we do the scholarship is in her memory. But he just wanted to let me know. 50 years later, what they were saying about her and the impact that, ooh, I'm going to choke up, y'all, and the impact that she had made on them. And um, that's success, y'all. 50 years later, people are talking about the impact you made 
just because you believed in them, just because you saw something in them and nourished their hearts. That is success. And so if we can start shifting out of teaching our children that it is all about the boxes you check for the sports you play and the clubs you attend and the the SAT scores and the whatever, all of that stuff. It has, it has its place. I hear you. It has a place, but that's not what success is. It can open doors. It can lead you down. If, if you are, if you are called to be a surgeon, you are going to take the door into college, into middle school, school. Like you have a lot of those doors to go through and I'm grateful for you. It's not the only door. But your value is still not your marks in school. Your marks in school may land you a job. Hopefully, the information you learn will make you successful. But it's not who you are. So that's all my dirty laundry about how I'm parenting and why I parent the way that I do is to nurture them so that they know they are so much more than a report card. Even the even the the comments that come home. My youngest son is is the most talkative person I know. And he is a happy chappy, but he's got something to say. And I, I think he's the only person I've ever known. I was a talkative person. He had a note of being too talkative in a PE class which I do feel like is next level. <laughs> like when your PE teacher is telling you you're too talkative, that is next level talkative. I also know that his ability to engage with people, his ability to make anyone feel at home and comfortable, his ability to have no strangers in the whole wide world is one of the things that will, will be his gift to the world. And so while I tell him to temper it when he can, I'm also not going to sit here and ground him and punishment, punish him for something I do think is a gift that he brings into the world. I, I struggle with the fact that we get frustrated with kids for not behaving when they're asked to sit in a classroom for eight hours a day, because I think that's so like, against what children are designed to be doing anyway. That's a whole nother episode, um, which I am hoping I can avoid because who needs that soapbox, y'all? But I, I just want us really to start cultivating a different idea of what success is. If, if you are, are struggling with anxiety and depression because of the, the expectations that are put on your shoulders, that's not success. I want you to understand that feeling good in your body and feeling comfortable in your relationships and taking care of yourself, that, that is success too. If there are teens listening, as you go into your exams, I really encourage you to A, set yourself up for success the night before. Get a good night's sleep. That's probably more important than 45 extra minutes of cramming is to get a good night's sleep. Set your morning up correctly. Do some affirmations. Tell yourself that you are a smart person, that you are a good test taker. Look yourself in the eyes and say that regardless of what you do, you're proud of yourself. Amplify your energy before you sit in that classroom, before you take that test. Amplify, pump yourself up. Listen to some uplifting music on your way to school. Do the things that make you feel energized and ready and powerful before you sit down. And parents, goodness gracious, I, I saw the most amazing post at one point that says, like, when your kid comes off of a field, a court, a, you know, wherever they're playing their sport, the best thing, the only thing you should ever say is, I love watching you play. That is not the time for a recap. It's not the time for or anything else. And I encourage you to take that approach with school too. If you if you know your kid is doing their best or at least doing, give them love because often what they need is a hug, not a lecture. Thank you for listening. 
share with anybody you think could use this and um, have a great week. I love you. There's a great new feature in the show notes to send me a message. If you have specific topics about being a teen or, or tween or about parenting consciously, please send me a message. Let me know what's on your mind and in your heart. Thanks for listening.